In May 2003, I found myself in Calcutta for the first time. I'd never been there. It's a fascinating city. Um, not so much um, a, uh, it's a cultural and um, intellectual hub of India, um, but it's also interesting because most people want to go there because they want to save it. Um, at that time, including me. I had just resigned from being a lawyer because I wanted to save the world, as we all do at some point in our, in our lives. Um, so I had gotten my first job uh, as the executive director of the New York office of a Spanish foundation that was funding a home and, a, and school for girls in, from the streets of Calcutta. This was my dream job. Um, but it quickly became apparent that I was going to have to leave pretty soon because beyond some of the cultural uh, difficulties between all these sort of mashed up cultures and the administrative difficulties, um, it was clear that the foundation hadn't yet figured out how to talk to the children, how to create programs around the children, the girls, that was relevant to their culture or their context. It had nothing to do with the children's stories. So for example, one donor um, would bring very expensive gifts from her home country to the children. One donor wanted to set up Western classical violin lessons. Another donor um, would actually wanted her own children to know how lucky they were in relation to these kids. So nothing about it felt like it was about the children. The last straw for me was when a donor asked me to help him set up a dowry system for the children after they graduated. Now dowry, the dowry system has been illegal in India since 1961, even if it's still in practice, so we couldn't actually do this. So none of it felt like the, um, the management's agenda was trumping the children's story, their country, their culture, and their context. So I ended up leaving. The good thing about um, the job for me, though, was that I met the people who started Kids with Cameras. These are the same people who, um, who created the film Born to Brothels, which, as Nicoletta said, won the Oscar in 2005. When I got there, the film had just been created, just, just been completed. So um, the film and the organization's mission was directed at the same kids, um, the kids from Calcutta, from the streets, as my first job had been. Um, these, these kids in the film were particularly from the red light district. Um, they were children of, of sex workers. But the difference was that the film and the mission of the organization was centered directly on the children's self-expression, on their cultural expression, on their photography. And a number of them, some permanently, found voice and found, um, found meaning in their lives through photography. Now, as executive director, um, I was charged with doing a number of things that you do um, with a startup organization, but I also got to participate in the distribution and engagement around the film and all the related assets. And I don't know if anybody's seen the film, but there were a number of different things that we did, um, including books, um, the children's photographs, which were sold to finance children's education, um, calendars and postcards and all these different things. What we didn't know back then, we didn't have the language, was that we were creating a fairly simple cross-platform um, project around the film. And it was a wild success. Uh, we were able to sell a number of photographs that were, are, have been now, about 10 years later, um, finance some of the kids' education. Um, so. It, this was all, by the way, this was all pre-social media, so I don't know how, I don't remember how we got it done. Um, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have Facebook, um, but it, it managed to be a success anyway. I think it was because we're all very passionate, but we're all very stubborn. So we managed to get it done. But what really worked, to go back to it, was that this was grounded in the children's self-expression. It was their voice. It was their art. We got criticized to a certain extent because we were a a Western organization coming in and people saw us as interfering, some people did. But that missed the point. The point was that we were helping the children express themselves. And today, about 10 years after the entire effort started, and five years after the Oscar was won, uh, the, the organization has managed to create a permanent home and school. They've, they've actually started constructing the building in Calcutta for this same group of children. So in this case, story created a legacy. So now I knew there was something there. I knew that story and art could create something beyond just raising awareness. And I knew that dis 
creating assets around a project, multiple assets that were distributed over a number of different platforms could affect social change. Now, I had quit the law, but I had quit the law because in my mind I had thought that there was something um, that I could do in human rights or rights and, and art. I just hadn't known what, and now I had a proof point in Kids With Cameras. Um, so, next. Three years ago, fast forward from Born to Brothels, I started a company in New York's little uh, strategic consultancy that's um, devoted to social change through culture, art, technology, and design as a tool for transformation. Also around three years ago, I met the co-director of this set of films called The Invisibles, a man named Mark Silver. The other co-director is um, Gael Garcia Bernal, who's a Mexican actor. Mark and I started talking about um, systemic change along the U.S.-Mexico border, um, about human rights and poverty alleviation for the populations that are crossing the border. Now, migration across borders by people who are experiencing lack of economic opportunity has become a, hum a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions around the world. Um, and it's really, really critical along the U.S.-Mexico border. So the invisibles, um, the series of sh four short films that you can actually see on YouTube um, right now on the Amnesty International YouTube channel, um, aims at showing the human side of the migration issue by showing us what people are going through and why they're forced to leave their homes. So what The Invisibles does is it presents the human face of the story through the stories of the migrants themselves. Right. So those four short films are now, I'm now help, uh, working with Mark um, on his next film called Who is Diane Cristal, which features Gael Garcia Bernal as well. The four short films are now part of an entire transmedia platform around the issue of migrants' rights and the movement of peoples from Central America up through across the border of the U.S. Um, we are, um, we're going to be creating a number of different assets that relate directly back to action points, activism, that affect um, economic and policy change, hopefully, that the migrants themselves, the people in the communities themselves, have asked for. Next. So around three, year, three years ago also, three years ago was a, a big time for me, um, I started working with an organization called Three Generations. This is an organization in New York founded by Jane Wells, who was a co-producer on The Devil Came on Horseback. This organization aims at um, curating and creating stories, again, from survivors of crimes against humanity. And it asks the question, what does it mean to be a survivor in uh, our world today, in a world of mass atrocity and geopolitical crisis? So the, the, the site, um, the, the website has a number of short films and photo essays, and there's a feature-length uh, film in production that will come out hopefully next year or the year after, um, and a number of different related assets that ask that question, and they get stories from survivors of crimes against humanity, of sex trafficking, Native Americans, um, veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, who are all sort of thinking about the issue of survivorship and what that means, what that means to come out of a ge geopolitical crisis. Now, these groups are um, obviously very, very different. They're very disparate. And the theories of change for each of them are very different. But we're drawing a narrative through line um, through each of these stories to talk about that question and to create um, an ecosystem of interconnected stories that we hope will trigger a new kind of um, advocacy around this and a new kind of dialogue and a shift in world perspective. We're also um, working now to try to embed transmedia storytelling directly into the model of the organization so that the organization, so that transmedia isn't only around each distinct asset, but it's part of the organizational DNA. Lakumizik. I don't know what the words mean, but this is a new uh, transmedia platform that I'm involved with, started by a man named Zach Niles, who is a co-founder of We Own TV in Sierra Leone. What he's doing is he's actually he's working with um, Haitian musicians to tell their stories and to create a distrib distribution stream around their music. Now, in um, post-earthquake in 2012, if you listened, to Andrew, there's been a lot of activity, there's been a lot of aid and development organizations coming in. This project aims a little bit differently. This project is looking at culture-based culture revitalization. Now, we don't 
think about culture or the cultural sector when we think about putting societies back together. We don't think about it when we think about strengthening societies too much. But all of you know how, how important the cultural sector is to community identity and to public participation and to individual self-expression. So in order to have a fully functioning, vital, resilient society, we need to have a strong uh, cultural sector. So that's what this, that's, this project is aiming at that. Right, so they're going to, he's going to create a number of entry points into um, the music and into the stories that the uh, musicians are telling about how they're trying to work to put their societies back together and the struggles they're facing. Okay. So the theory um, of this project as well is that people are going to be connecting back um, into Haiti. We've kind of moved on as a world, right? Because we're thinking about, we've been thinking this year about the Arab Spring, the economic crisis. We're going to think about the next crisis that's going to come because it will. Um, but this will hopefully create a long and sustained connection back to Haiti because it'll be about people who are creating a way forward um, and creating hope. Whoops. Sorry. There we go. Um, so speaking of the Arab Spring, uh, this, is the, this is a project that I'm not working on. This is the only one I'm talking about that I'm not working on. Um, it's amazing, though, because it's about, um, it's transmedia around uh, the occupation of Tahrir Square, like Mohammed talked about earlier this morning. I'm going to read this because this isn't mine, so excuse me. They're launching a beta within a matter of days or weeks that is a set of collection tools that tap into people's Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, and YouTube accounts so that they can select the media they want to contribute to the story. So the platform grows and survives through group participation. The project founder, Jigar Mehta, believes that stories that are told together are stronger. So the project is focusing on groups telling the story of the moments from the revolution that matter to them. The ultimate point is to cross platforms to create a shared living memory of the spirit and arc of the revolution so that as the entire region moves forward, they keep the spirit of the revolution alive. So I've chosen to work or highlight um, these projects because they have in common a few things. First, each has at its, at its core the use of local voice in direct partnership with the platform creator. That's really important, the local voice, right? So they're truly community-centered participation. Second, each uses its platform to move beyond awareness. It doesn't stay at awareness. It moves beyond to connect participants to commit to a particular worldview, to advocacy, or to action. And finally, each project uses a number of different platforms to cross boundaries and uh, borders to foster transformation. So um, this is how I think of transmedia, moving people from awareness to engagement, to action, action to change. To go from um, awareness to engagement, right? You have to have those three things that I just mentioned. Local voice, direct action as entry points, and cross-platform to cross boundaries. Right? From engagement to action is, um, is to use story, actionable stories. Stories that want, make people want to make things happen, not just listen. And then moving from action to change, that usually happens in, um, at the grassroots or institutional levels. So it's really important to have a partnership with a community-facing organization. But the work that we do, everybody in this room, is in that middle, is sort of the awareness, the engagement, the action. We're creating the assets around that, right? So for a transmedia platform to work in social change, it doesn't actually have to be that complicated. Um, the question is, how do you extend the story to connect people to others and to solutions? So don't make the platform about the technology. Find your audiences through the technology, but make it about the people, not about the technology. Make it about the issues. Because ultimately, social change is about making people's lives better or creating opportunity for them to have freedom, safety, and security, and a better life. Because a better life, I mean, it's different for everyone. We don't, we don't know what a better life means to everyone. Narrative is the currency in the social change equation that lets us know what they want. So what if we thought of narrative as an invaluable asset in social change? Then we wouldn't think about a single story or a top-down solution, or as people as widgets <laughs> moving forward from one data point to another. Um, we have to, you know, one of the things that I don't like hearing most of the time is the phrase giving voice to the voiceless, because no one's voiceless. We just have to learn to listen better. And to listen better, we have to create those avenues for voice, hence cross-platform. 
in which everybody can be a partner, right? Because we can, we can create those avenues of participation that lead to that direct partnership. Um, lastly, this is the way I think that social change, uh, transmedia for social change is gonna evolve. And I challenge all of you, and I challenge myself, um, to sort of explore these things. We're on the brink of something really big here. People are talking about um, the creation of a global mind through social networks, or the connection of people through global, the rise of global cities, right? This is an aligned movement. Cross-platform is an aligned movement with that. We can create dialogue in ways that we never could before. And you all, as, as broadcasters and media creators and people who know how to leverage this stuff, we can all create those avenues for voice. We can create those avenues for stories from the local communities. On October 31st of this year, I read somewhere in one month, the seven billionth person is going to be born. Seven billion people in this world. That is a lot of people. That is a lot of problems, and some of them are, some of these projects are addressing those problems. But it's also a lot of stories, at least seven billion stories, and with story comes opportunity. So let's get to work. Thanks.